Welcome everyone, and thank you for being here today. Before we begin our event, I would like us to take a moment to pause and reflect upon the deep and enduring connections that Indigenous, First Nations, and Métis people have had upon this land. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. As a virtual organization operating from coast to coast to coast, we respectfully acknowledge the ancestral territories and rights of all Inuit and First Nation and Métis people and are grateful they have inhabited and taken care of these lands for millennia. We are committed to doing our part to help move forward Canada's ongoing and harmful colonial history and working towards reconciliation. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way try to move forward in the spirit of truth, reconciliation and collaboration. Before we begin our programming, please note that this event is being recorded. All attendees will be muted throughout this event. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sherry Shannon Vanstone, President and CEO of Profound Impact. Thank you, Cheryl. As Cheryl mentioned, I am the founder, president, and CEO of Profound Impact. And I'm so excited to welcome you to Profound Impact Day 2024. Now in our fifth year, Profound Impact celebrates most diverse leaders, change makers, and researchers who are leaving their mark on the global community through their initiatives, influence, and impact. This past weekend, on September 14th, my late husband, Dr. Scott Vanstone's daughter, Andrea, her family and I celebrated what would have been Scott's 77th birthday. Now it doesn't take a cryptographer, a mathematician, or he went on this webinar to quickly comprehend that 77 equals 11 times 7. Now, both numbers, some would consider lucky numbers, so I guess I should have bought a love ticket on, on Saturday. I was reflecting after Andrea left yesterday that profound impact was in, founded on the inspiration of Scott's impact. First, on how we measure worldwide impact of an individual, in particular Scott's impact, and then impact of a faculty, that is the faculty of mathematics at the University of Waterloo, where Scott was professor for 35 years. The faculty at mathematics, uh, of, of mathematics at Waterloo is unique as most mathematics departments are in the faculty of science. Now, Profound Impact has been working with the faculty of mathematics at Waterloo for several years to try to measure the faculty's global impact, which is far reaching. Retrospectively, Profound Impact's existence and its why to connect great people, do great things, inspired and facilitated the solution, Research Impact, our AI-powered software-as-a-service platform that provides a perfect match of researcher to industry partners and funding. Now, this is what happened with Scott. In 1985, he sat in a conference lecture in Santa Barbara, California, and listened to a talk about elliptic curve cryptography. And he quickly recognized that what he heard was a theory that if it could be commercialized, would change the world of information security. No one else in that conference heard what he heard. So from 1985 to his passing in 2014, he and others took that theory, along with over $6 million of research funding from federal, provincial, and most importantly, industry, both in, from Canada and the US. And this is not including the financing that Certicom, the company that he spun out of University of Waterloo, brought in. And they built a commercial product that resulted in what is estimated to be $6 trillion of annual global impact. Now, let me repeat this, $6 trillion of annual global impact. It was from theory to commercialization. Now, that is collaboration between industry and academia. And that is productivity and that is impact. In the next, next hour, those are the themes that we will be focusing on. First, it's about collaboration and partnership between industry and academia for Cheryl Petrosevic, Profound Impacts Director of Strategic Alliances of Partnerships, and Dr. Kelly Lyons, Awards Chair for the CSCAN, InfoCAN, will discuss the benefits of strategic relationships and tell us about the CSCAN 
InfoCan Awards. Next, Brian Romanski, Profound Impact's Chief Strategic Officer, will spend a few minutes talking about new features with Research Impact, an exciting partnership that we announced in June at the Collision Conference. And finally, we'll focus on impact by early career researchers, where we will have Dr. Faridan Handelopper, former president of University of Waterloo and a good friend of mine, having a fireside chat with two of the three researchers who were recently named as CSCAN, InfoCAN, Outstanding Early Career Computer Science Researcher Award winners, sponsored by Profound Impact. Now, please join me and welcome Cheryl and Kelly. Over to you. Wow, thank you. Uh, Six trillion dollars is a crazy number. So uh, let's learn a little bit more about that kind of impact. So in business, as in our personal lives, relationships are supremely important. Profound Impact has developed significant relationships that have contributed greatly to our success. Our partnership with CSCAN InfoCAN led to our sponsorship of the Outstanding Early Career Computer Science Researcher Awards, among other synergistic activities. Developing relationships with industry associations such as AI Partnerships Corp, Foresight Canada, and Hall Tech or Innovation Factory has strengthened our flagship product, Research Impact, with the ability to match industry partners with academic researchers. Joining me today is Dr. Kelly Lyons, Professor, Faculty of Information, in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto and the awards chair of CSCAN InfoCAN Awards Committee. Prior to joining academia, Dr. Lyons was the head of IBM CAS Toronto, where she was responsible for approximately 60 applied collaborative research projects with the universities, approximately 100 visiting university researchers in CASCON, Canada's premier international general computer science conference. Dr. Lyons, thank you for joining us today. Kelly and I, go ahead. No, I just said thank you. <laughs> Kelly and I are going to engage in a rapid fire 15 minute conversation designed to inspire and intrigue you, the audience, to introduce you to industry academia co collaborations and the importance of early career recognition. So here we go. Dr. Lyons, what are some of the key challenges you have observed when industry and academia try to collaborate? And how can these challenges be overcome? Well, first, I just want to say thank you, Cheryl, and, and uh, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I've been involved in and benefited from industry academic collaborations as a doctoral student, as an industry person at IBM, and most recently as a faculty researcher. So, And we all know the many benefits, of course, um, but so I will uh, address a couple of challenges. Um, so once people have come together, and I think profound impact is uh, very helpful in bringing those uh, the industry and academic collaborators together, and may, we'll talk a bit more about that as well, um, then the challenges are, are um, they're not over, hard to overcome, but they're pretty solid uh, challenges. And I just want to highlight three. The first is that industry and academia work on different time schedules. In industry, we have quarterly checkpoints, but we expect much more frequent uh, results than that. Uh, in research in general, but specifically in academia, it typically takes a little longer. Uh, graduate students who work on the research have course requirements and thesis requirements that have to be met. And as faculty members, we have other uh, demands on our time, including uh, teaching, uh, which is an important aspect of our, of our careers in academia. And we often have uh, three to five year time horizons on research projects or programs we're involved in. So that's the first challenge. Um, the second, and then I'll address the how we overcome them. But the second is that we have different measurement systems. Publications are very important in academia and thesis, thesis completion for students who are working on these projects is um, essential. Um, and third, and this is my favorite, and I'll explain why when I talk about uh, the how to overcome these, uh, sometimes it's difficult to identify a problem that will be interesting and important from a research perspective, and at the same time be interesting and important in advancing products or services in the industry in the short term. Uh, so an important aspect of dealing with all of these challenges is when industry and academic collaborators build a relationship of trust and respect. And that's really important. And that's also how we can help leverage this expertise in academia through industry to accelerate innovation. 
But to do this, there needs to be opportunities and time for employees to build these relationships and spend time contributing to and working with the research teams on these projects. It isn't helpful usually to just toss a problem over to a research team and hope a result comes back that is helpful. Uh, a true collaboration, which is what we're talking about here, takes a time commitment from both sides. It's also important in industry to establish practices and policies that take these things into account, the need for publishing results the de and dealing with the challenges of the different timelines. So, for example, agreements are usually uh, part of the collaboration, and these need to ensure there's opportunity for industry to review uh, uh, p written material prior to publication, of course, but that that time for doing that review should be reasonable and allow for timely publication, including that of thesis results, which is really important. It's also helpful to ensure that the research work is part of a collaboration that's part of this kind of collaboration isn't critical uh, to the short term success of a product or service, but instead has a longer term collaboration with um, uh, or a longer term potential output. And that those critical parts are done by the teams that are working, the employees that are working on those. Um, but it's also helpful to have policies that ensure, as I said before, employees have time to work on these longer term projects and collaborations, as well as accomplishing their important short term tasks in the company. But as I said, my favorite of the three challenges is this one of trying to identify a problem that's important uh, both in, in both environments. And the reason that's my favorite is I actually think this is the secret sauce of industry academic collaborations. The best collaborations I've been involved in are the ones where industry has a, a problem or a set of problems that they want help with. And the, researchers the researcher has approaches that might be helpful but then they sit down together and they end up defining something, a project, an approach that neither would have worked on or defined if they hadn't come together and had that conversation. So to me, that's the most exciting way of overcoming these challenges, bringing them together. Wow, you know, I I love the I love the the three pronged approach that you have to uh, outlining how the to work together and get the. Um, the collaborations moving forward and really taking a taking a look at both sides of it, making sure that you've got the measurement systems in place. I think this is this is great. My next question was going to be to you, like, how can industry better leverage the expertise and resources available in academic institutions to accelerate innovation? So is there something that you think, you know, you mentioned um, industry just tossing a project over the fence. Uh, to academia, but is there a way that they could couch it or phrase it, or did you kind of, uh, you know, address that in the, um, this is a partnership and in building the trust and respect, is there a, 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 an entry point that industry should take a look at before they just start tossing things over? Ah, uh, that's a great, uh, a great question, and I think um, part of it is is having opportunities to come together or or taking advantage of. Um, uh, these tools like the one that Profound Impact has to try to do that, that kind of matchmaking uh, and then coming up with ways to um, engage. And I think one of the things that I think is really helpful is finding um, young, um, strong, early career employees and giving them opportunities to attend a conference or come go to a seminar at, uh, at a university. Um, it's it's a, a kind of reward for the employee, but at the same time, they can come back with, and they can be, you know, asked to come back with, you know, maybe three ideas that would be helpful to the uh, company or to the task that the challenges the company is facing at that time, and the names and contact information of, of people that would be able to help support that uh, work in that area. Um, that's a that can be a, a fun way to to uh, engage with academia in the in the in the new in new ways. And that's a nice tie-in too to the fact that we're here helping in in honoring new career, early career researchers. There's your early career employees as well, so it's good to keep that uh, that partnership in mind. You know, at the as I mentioned at the start, Profound Impact is proud of the relationships we've developed with sector-led groups like CSKN. Uh, we've also had uh, partnerships with the Canadian Mathematical Society and industry-focused groups like AI Partnerships. Foresight Canada, Haltech, and Innovation Factory. The team at Profound Impact knows that partnerships are critical to building pathways for elevating the innovation game. 
by tapping into the rich resources and expertise of industry and academia, discovering the strategies to harness college and university research, accessing skilled research talent and leveraging high-end resources to accelerate the innovation journey while reducing costs and time to market. That's why we created the AI powered platform called Research Impact as Kelly had mentioned uh, through some of her answers. And Kelly, is there some way like areas of supports do researchers need to engage with industry? So is there something that, that researchers can do? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that the, one of the biggest areas is just having opportunities to meet with and talk to different people in industry to learn about the kinds of challenges that might be addressed by their research. So finding opportunities to bring people together, uh, this event, for example, but also at conferences and seminars, bringing researchers in to industry to share their knowledge with the employees is really helpful as well. And of course, finding appropriate uh, funding opportunities um, is a real, a real helpful um, contribution or way that uh, researchers can be supported to engage with industry. Awesome, thanks. So we're here today to honor the CSCAN Outstanding Early Career Computer Science Research Award winners. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about what is CSCAN and why are partnerships with industry partners like Profound Impact important to the membership? Oh, that's a great question. So CSCAN is the Canadian Association for Computer Science. Um, and it's its real goal is to try to promote and support research and industry and computer science in Canada. Specifically, there's three main, main goals, parts of the mission. One is advancing computer science research and education. This involves um, fostering excellence in computer science research, uh, highlighting uh, researchers and their, their excellence, but also supporting higher education across Canada through conferences, um, but also advocating for necessary funding, enhancing computer science education and influencing public policy that supports the discipline across the country. It also involves recognizing talent and promoting excellence. And we'll talk maybe a bit more about the awards like the Outstanding Early Career Computer Science Researcher Award, the individuals that we're honoring today and on which we partner. Um, but also to elevate uh, their contributions and encourage continued innovation in the field. And finally, as you mentioned, building collaborative relationships is really important, especially with industry, because that, I believe, is how um, we can differentiate ourselves as a, a small Canada in, in many ways is a small, um, although we're geographically large, we are a small community and enabling um, these opportunities for collaborative relationships can really showcase what Canada, Canada can do worldwide and in internationally. So for anybody in the audience, this is an important association and an important uh, critical uh, cog in the innovation wheel in, uh, in Canada. So thank you to everybody who is part of the membership and the board who supports the uh, support CSCAN and to the members, of course. Um, Kelly, can you share a little bit more about the selection process for the CSCAN Outstanding Early Career Computer Science Research Awards? Sure. It is a very challenging task that we have. It's a highly competitive award. We have a committee of outstanding researchers that come from universities across Canada. Um, we have very uh, significant breadth um, in our disciplinary expertise and diversity of perspective. Uh, the outstanding early career researchers are nominated by colleagues, uh, faculty members, usually senior faculty members in computer science in Canada. And each year we have a large number of nominations. Last year alone, we had 17 uh, outstanding individuals nominated. And you can just imagine the challenge we have, the difficult task we have of selecting three each year for this award. And many of them, you know, we really are recognizing outstanding research, outstanding researchers, but many of these individuals are outstanding across teaching, research, their contributions to the field. And uh, it's really a, a, an, an honor to be part of this committee, but also it's a challenging task to identify the three that will be awarded in any given year. Wow. What, 17 nominees, that is, that's crazy. And, and congratulations to the, the award winners that we'll hear from later. But what impact do you hope that these awards will have on the career trajectories of the nominees and the winners? Yeah, it's really an important um, uh, recognition of the contributions. It also, 
I think if for those, if anyone was worried about the future of computer science research in Canada, please do not be worried. We, we have outstanding individuals contributing to this field. Um, many of the award winners go on to receive significant awards in the future, um, either in computer science at the international level or in Canada um, awards that recognize uh, research in all of the natural sciences and engineering. And, and you know, that's a real strength of uh, one of the advantages of CSCAN and partnerships such as this is that we're able to um, elevate and, and recognize individuals who can then go on and win uh, such awards as a Stacy Memorial Fellowship uh, as a computer scientist, which is really great. Many of our award winners go on to hold Canada Research Chairs uh, or already do, and they have um, also, uh, they go on to have significant leadership roles in their discipline and within the university. I also think it's important, um, there's a lot of opportunity for these outstanding individuals worldwide. And we really need to be able to recruit and retain computer science researchers in Canada. And so having, um, you know, these kinds of awards and having support for them to flourish in their careers and here in Canada really helps us uh, to be able to do so. Thank you so much um, for, for sharing the information that you've given us about CSCAN, about the importance of the early career uh, researchers and the, the work that they're doing. And, uh, and talking a little bit about industry and academic partnerships too, because we know that this it's a whole package that comes together to really make a difference. So Dr. Lawrence, thank you for sharing, uh, generous sharing of your lifetime of experience in the intersection of academia and industry. The team at Profound Impact would like to extend our congratulations to Dr. Lyons, who is an award winner herself this year with recognition from her peers in the category of distinguished service. Congratulations, Kelly, on this recognition. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And I want to thank Profound Impact for sponsoring the award and for providing this opportunity for us to hear from the award winners themselves. Thank you. Folks, Folks, I know we've just touched the tip of the iceberg and we look forward to learning more as we continue to develop our CSCAN relationship. Before I hand the program over to my colleagues and the award winners, I want to extend a thank you to our webinar attendees. We appreciate your attention. We all know learning never stops and opportunities to hear from leaders like this are not to be missed. So well done in making this a priority in your day. So speaking of great partnerships, my colleague, Brian Romanski is gonna share some news about an exciting development. Over to you, Brian. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, give me one second. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, just, I'll be very brief. And uh, comment that, um, so I've actually got two partnerships I can talk about. So as Sherry mentioned at the beginning, uh, Research Impact is uh, the, the cornerstone product of uh, a profound impact. It brings together academic researchers and matches them against funding opportunities, collaborators, and industry partners. Um, as Dr. Lyons had mentioned, those partnerships are really critical, uh, both academic collaborations and collaboration with the industry. And uh, Research Impact helps to make that happen. Unlike a conventional um, a search engine that can bring, you know, you, you put in a search term and it, it identifies potential matches, uh, Research Impact is actually more of a proactive matching engine. So it builds a detailed profile on each academic researcher and looks proactively for uh, matches that are best fit for their current state of their academic career and their research interests. Uh, it is built using AI technology and uh, Research Impact is an early adopter of the Amazon Web Services Bedrock platform. Uh, this platform allows us to have access to multiple AI engines. So while I'm sure all of you have experience firsthand of using a large language model and challenging it with questions and seeing what it can do for you and some of the limitations of what they can do. Uh, we've actually taken that much further. So through the Amazon Bedrock platform, we use multiple large language models. We've developed dozens of custom prompts that we use to uh, part of a workflow that bring together um, those researcher profiles, information about grants, and those industry partners to make those strong recommendations. And we test that against uh, feedback from our clients and also experts in the field of research administration to make sure that the engine's recommendations are targeted and relevant. We've just relaunched our V2 or next generation matching engine. So it's a whole new set of AI engines, L large language models underneath the, the covers. 
um, a multitude of them run by, as I said, dozens of custom prompts, pulling it together to make sure that we have the most relevant, most targeted matches. And I can also add, as, as Sherry had announced at the Collision Conference, we continue to work with a strategic partner, um, eVision, and their Cinto product. Uh, Cinto takes uh, the starting point that we perform with Profound Impact, um, that research impact matching engine, and provides a workflow and col uh, a, a collaboration and uh, a compliance capability that continues the, the benefits uh, to researchers and to uh, industry partners and to funders uh, to create a complete solution. You will hear more about this in the, uh, the coming months, um, but that work continues. With that, I want to go back to our program. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Now I'm delighted to turn to the main event, recognizing the CSCAN, InfoCAN Outstanding Early Career Computer Science Researcher Award winners. Dr. Rob, Roger Gross of the University of Toronto is one of the outstanding early career computer science award winners, but he is unable to be with us today. Dr. Gross is an esteemed associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. With a robust research focus on machine learning and artificial intelligence, Dr. Gross's work explores innovative approaches to learning algorithms and their applications. His research interests span topics such as neural network training, probabilistic models, and a scalable learning methods. Dr. Gross holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and has contributed significantly to the field through numerous publications and collaborations. His work is, is instrumental in advancing our understanding of complex machine learning systems and their practical implementations. As a leading researcher, Dr. Gross is committed to pushing the boundaries of what is possible with machine learning technologies, making impactful contributions to both academia and industry. Congratulations, Dr. Gross. Now I'd like to introduce two of the award winners who are joining us today, along with Dr. Farid and Andaluper, in their side chat. First is Dr. Ali Uni who's a professor at École de Technologie Supérieure in Montreal, specializing in software engineering and artificial intelligence. His research focuses on developing advanced AI-based solutions to improve software engineering practices. Dr. Uni's work is pivotal in the fields of software engineering and artificial intelligence, where he explores innovative techniques to improve software reliability. His contributions aim to enhance software quality and maintainability in a cost-effective manner while improving software developers' productivity. With a robust academic background and a strong track record of research, Dr. Uni is dedicated to advancing the state of art in software engineering and its applications, driving progress in both academia and practical contexts. The second researcher that we have with us today is Dr. Liam Paul. He is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Operation Research at the University of Montreal. His research for, focuses on robotics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, with a particular emphasis on developing algorithms that enable robots to perceive and interact with complex environments. Sounds very interesting. Dr. Paul's work explores areas such as autonomous systems, robot perception, and human-robot interaction. He is dedicated to advancing the field of robotics through innovative research and applications that address real world challenges. And with a strong academic background and a commitment to impactful research, Dr. Paul is shaping the future of robotics and AI, contributing valuable insights and technological advancements to the field. And to be our host, to lead this fireside chat is Dr. Faraday Vandeluk, the former president and vice chancellor at the University of Waterloo. Faraday is also the recipient of Profound's first Impact 2021 Impactful Options Award. He was our first, but it was awarded in 2021. Faraday is proud to have been one of the 10 global university presidents appointed to the United Nations He for She Impact 10 by 10 by 10 campaign to engage boys and men in the cause of gender equity. He also served as chair of the Waterloo Global 
science initiative, as well as taking active roles in many other communities and boards. It's great to have you back with us this year for Profound Impact Day. Now, over to Farida. Thank you very much, Sherry. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. And thanks so much for having me here today to, to be part of this incredible uh, celebration and acknowledgement. Um, uh, Sherry, I should also uh, personally congratulate you for evolving the Profound Im Impact Award into something uh, that is very different than when it when you first started. So uh, this is called innovation. So my congratulations to you and to the organization. Um, I just arrived in uh, Ottawa uh, this morning and I'm from my room. I'm just looking at our magnificent Parliament Hill and I'm just thinking how many times I walked up and down the uh, stairs and talking to many, many people. Uh, bringing our research infrastructure, academic re research infrastructure, to a point where we can say that in Canada, we have, we are so fortunate to have brilliant researchers that we used to lose them uh, before CRC, before CFI. And now we have, we are so fortunate to have these brilliant minds generating, creating absolutely the state of the art, the newest knowledge. So congratulations, Ali. Congratulations, Liam. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Also, um, I mean, it's called early career, but looking at your accomplishments, it's hardly early. You've, you've been running on this pathway for a while, and I think uh, uh, where you'll be going is going to be also very, very exciting. So, Ali, I'm going to ask the same question to Liam as well. Um, this is an incredibly exciting, fast-changing world. Um, I don't consider myself old. I'm still very young, but I know how to use a slide rule. And from that point to we are talking about quantum computers, we are talking about uh, AI, all kinds of things. Where do you see your research fitting in? Just think of a picture, that picture, not maybe now or a few years down the road. And how would your research will help create this picture or paint that picture? Where, where does it fit in? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Frieden, Churi, and everyone for the warm introduction and uh, for this honor uh, to participate in the Profound uh, Impact Day. So this is absolutely a great pleasure for me to be with all of you today. And uh, thank you for the great question to start with. So, you know, um, so um, today the, the technology is changing uh, almost uh, every aspect in our everyday life. And uh, my research or my core research area is in software engineering and artificial intelligence. And you know, like we're all, we are surrounded by thousands or even millions of software systems that we can use in almost every aspect in every uh, uh, in every aspect of our everyday life. So my research focusing on software engineering, uh, software maintenance and evolution, DevOps, uh, empirical software engineering, and uh, in particular, the application of AI techniques to solve problems uh, in software engineering. And the main objective of my research goal is to make uh, uh, life of uh, software users easier but also software developers who are developing those software systems um, to make uh, their products uh, more uh, like uh, uh, reliable, uh, to reduce the cost, uh, and to, to make um, uh, them uh, in, in, in a cost-effective manner. So the main goal of my research is to provide techniques and solutions to support the automation of software development and maintenance tasks that developers can use to maintain and evolve their software systems more effectively and in a cost-effective manner. So, um, uh, so my research work uh, to date aims to address the famous question that uh, every software practitioner and uh, software the engineering researcher always have in mind. So, which is how to develop software systems, especially those large-scale systems with high quality low cost and uh, within schedule. So those are a lot of uh, conflicting uh, 
uh, aspects that everyone is looking to do. So my research approach to address those uh, uh, challenges is to develop advanced AI techniques using uh, program analysis, software analytics, uh, and to leverage them to uh, uh, on software development data, such as those that we can uh, bring from the source code, from bug reports, from code review, documentation, uh, developers' uh, discussions and use the discovered done knowledge to support software practitioners in performing um, uh, knowledge-based decisions um, and uh, activities using like AI such uh, uh, so that we can improve software quality. So many of the solutions and um, techniques we are developing in my research team are done in collaboration with industry, so responding to uh, uh, existing needs in, in, in uh, Canadian industry or international uh, industry in software uh, or in uh, the IT sector. And uh, many of them have been published in leading journals and conferences and uh, serv with several uh, 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 international recognitions like best paper awards and uh, most influential paper awards. So uh, that's give us an overview about uh, what kind of uh, research I'm doing with my research team. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. It's just head spinning. <laughs> it's it's fantastic. Liam, uh, how would you paint that picture? Where does your uh, research fit in? Which is, uh, I think it's part of the same big picture, but I think it occupies a different corner. Unmute, please, uh, Paul. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, sorry about that. I'll, I'll also, uh, yeah, express my profound uh, honor uh, to be here and for for the recognition. And uh, thank you all for for your time and uh, wanting to come and listen to to what maybe we have to say. Um, so I think robotics. So I, I do robotics research more or less, and I think robotics is a very particular and unique kind of. Uh, subfield, I would call it a subfield of computer science, but there's also, of course, the sort of more mechanical versions, but I do computer science. Because I think that, yeah, as you said, like the world has changed a lot. You know, we used to use slide rules. And if you'd probably asked people, you know, 30, 40 years ago, what they thought the world would look like, they probably would have guessed that robots would play a larger role in our in our world than they probably do now, especially personal robots. I mean, I think we've been very successful at like automating manufacturing process and things like this. Um, but the the number of cases of actual like successful personal home robots is like relatively, relatively limited. And so uh, I guess this is what what we're trying to solve in my lab. And I think it's a really, really interesting time right now. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, the world uh, really changed in the last 10 years from, say, like ImageNet uh, onwards that, you know, we all saw the potential of being able to leverage data directly and label data to be able to solve these some of these really hard problems. And that transformed so many subfields of of machine learning of uh, of computer science. You even listened to Ali talking about it. He's it's tra transformed software engineering. It's transformed everything. But in robotics, there's always these kind of like special special constraints. Uh, and I think what's really interesting for me is to actually think about and and a lot of what we think about in my lab is how to take these technologies, these sort of like data driven approaches. And how to apply them within like a real world embodied system. And if you think about a, you know, a system like an autonomous car, right? Like there's very, very specific constraints, safety constraints. Like we need to worry a lot about certain, certain aspects of this system. And there are some kind of byproducts of data-driven systems that are a little bit unappealing uh, from this standpoint. Like they tend to be relatively black box. So maybe their performance is better. But maybe we, when they fail, we don't know uh, when they're going to fail or why. And so this is un unsettling, right, for any kind of system that's going to uh, have any kind of like uh, be deployed in some kind of risk sensitive uh, environment. So, yeah. So in some large level, what we're thinking about in my lab, because I'm 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 close to the Quebec AI Institute, Mila, and I'm I'm a core member, and there's a lot of AI experts in Montreal and deep learning experts. 
um, I think really hard about how, what are the right ways to leverage this kind of approach, this kind of uh, machine learning based approach in physically embodied systems. And that involves, I, I think like, like a lot of things, it involves not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in some sense, like the way that we did things in the past, maybe it was a little bit more structured and, and hand engineered. But maybe some of those some of those uh, abstractions are still useful. But we should figure out where are the right places, say within a robot system, to actually do a better job with some kind of a machine learning approach than we could have done with some kind of like hand engineered approach. And what are the potential benefits? And what are the potential mm, risks or pitfalls? Uh, maybe that's sort of like my my large large picture. Very good to hear, Liam. Of course. Uh... Um, as I'm listening to both of you, I'm thinking about, well, what if uh, softwares will start writing softwares, but then your research comes in and says, well, hey, wait a second, I'm also working on human-machine interaction, so there's always an involvement in interaction of humans. Um, um, I listened to um, Kelly and Brian uh, uh, with uh, great joy, and they both talked about um, how... Uh, what we do at our academic institutions has to be done in a in a partnership uh, with with the rest of the world, um, especially um, if you look at every aspect of what each one of you is doing, uh, whether it's in uh, the health area, whether it's in high comp uh, capacity computational area, data collection, data management, data duration, any of those, there is an incredible potential for um, a commercial commercialization. There is a significant uh, there, race around the world. Everybody is re rushing to hold a piece of that uh, uh, new IP that they will generate. How do you look at it from your perspective when you are um, in your lab, when you're writing your papers, how do you see yourself as being part of that? And I'm a big proponent of uh, our democracies uh, will uh, flourish in a prosperous environment. And how do we then connect our research in prosperity, jobs, knowledge generation? Ali, I'll start with you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, again, so, uh, you know, today, so um, I think we are in, uh, as you said earlier, in a, in a fast changing world and uh, uh, technology, uh, so this is tomorrow, so this is the technology that everyone is seeking today to, to solve problems, and I think connections exist uh, um, among many uh, uh, application fields, and uh, and uh, so, you know, here, so uh, the recent advances such as the use of um, uh, like large language models, uh, I think Brian talked here about the potential of LLMs and other Amazon products. And uh, everyone today can have uh, similar ideas uh, that who can implement or who can develop and uh, evolve faster. And what makes change maybe uh, between researchers or in the community who can do it faster and who can do it properly uh, to ensure having an impact and to ensure connecting different uh, uh, technologies or different uh, sub-communities. For example, we in software engineering and we are working on developing or improving software quality and the end goal is to make users satisfied. And as you said, so your field is computer, uh, human computer interaction. So th there, there is a kind of uh, connection already between, um, I mean, my field and your field. And also Liam, who is working on robotics also, because robotics are basically software. So we need to develop software to make those uh, robots uh, do the expected tasks. So connections, I think, already exist. And uh, many collaborations can be... Uh, I mean, uh, can be built to make uh, maybe uh, better products. And uh, we see that even in conferences, sometimes you have a lot of, uh, I mean, um, 
uh, subfields and sometimes committee uh, is working separately, but the link is always there and we might be able to uh, to bring some uh, like new collaborative work, like maybe in, even in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering in, or in other fields and to put efforts together in order to bring uh, maybe some new uh, like innovative solutions to recurrent problems and to bring new perspectives and new uh, uh, ideas there. Mm -hmm. So thanks, uh, Ali. Liam, how do you find the environment at your institution, uh, University of Montréal? Um, do you find that this is that's the kind of environment we just try to uh, sketch, uh, that uh, you're not just confined within the uh, walls of the institution, but you're connected with the immediate and uh, uh, industries uh, and sectors beyond the walls of the institution? And how is the uh, university helping you, or if they're helping you with uh, finding that? Yeah, uh, I would say I feel particularly lucky and privileged to be where I am. Uh, I think there's certainly the university uh, plays a role, but there's also these other institutions now that exist in Montreal uh, who whose specific mandate is exactly this. So uh, maybe for folks that are outside of Montreal, they wouldn't know them, but there's there's Mila, which is the Quebec AI uh, Institute for, for Learning Algorithms. Um, and there's a huge impetus within Mila to uh, to broker these kind of connections. And there's a like a long now list of startups that have been generated by uh, Mila students and uh, tons and tons of industry collaboration uh, through through Mila. So that's I think that is all a, a byproduct of really good, a really like good vision for for what was a strength in Canada in terms of AI and machine learning, and then really investing in that strength through the establishment of the three institutes, Mila, Vector, and Amy in in Alberta, which I think has just transformed the AI landscape in, in Canada and has, uh, you know, turned us into an, a, like an international leader in this field. So uh, I feel very lucky to be part of that. There's also here uh, in Montreal, there's uh, IVADO, the Institute de Valorisation de Données, which also has a similar mandate to try to broker these kind of connections. And I've also had research partnerships uh, that have been, that have been generated through that. But maybe one, one other thing to add on this. I mean, I think, you know, I'm very proud of the work that we do and the papers that we publish. But the thing that I'm always the most proud of are the students. And somehow like this is the the my 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 profound impact, uh, you know, not to like uh, uh, put too fine a point on it, is really the students that come out of the lab. And I, what they go on to do and like the way that this kind of multiplies and they go out into industry and they work in industry and these connections are, are strengthened. Uh, this to me is, uh, it's why I do this job. You know, it's, uh, it's really what it's all about. Well, Liam, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And you also uh, just, just basically practically walked into my next question, <laughs> which you, would have been something very similar like this. But if I could just give you an example from my own career, I worked in the industry for a while, went back to the academia, went back and forth. But the final decision was that I want to stay in the academia. And the main factor was the students. Uh, I could have been a researcher at an organization um, uh, that didn't involve students, but the joy of whether they're undergraduate students or graduate students in your lab, they give you the inspiration, they give you the continuity, they just make it just uh, very, very different and very meaningful. So when you bring them all in, it is fabulous. And uh, Brian, I think I love the uh, new iteration or new version of uh, what you're creating. And I hope that in there, also students will be part of that 
getting to know this research, getting to know this research or industry, but students will be part of that. So let me go back our time. I'm very much enjoying this conversation, but before um, uh, Cheryl comes and says, well, your time is up, um, let me move it forward. Um, I never ever thought that I will become an academic administrator, yet I uh, I did, and um, um, I must say I enjoyed it very much. So put yourself in that position at your institution. Uh, what would you do differently so that your researchers like yourself uh, who are involved in like every minute of your day is count, counted for either for your research or teaching or supervision, writing grants and contracts and then reports, expense reports. What would you do to make a life not easier because it doesn't get easy, it gets more exciting, but a little less uh, bureaucratic uh, and more uh, proactive? Who would like to take a step? Who wants to become an administrator? I, I, I can start. So, I mean, I think for me, uh... It's it's about administrative support, honestly. I mean, uh, th there's so many there's so many people behind the scenes, and like we get to sit here and we get you know the amazing recognition of these awards, but there's so much support staff through so many different mechanisms who play such a huge role in our success that don't get that kind of recognition. And so, I mean, those are the those are the those are the cogs. Those are the key people who you know who we all need to thank for uh, for the environments that that we that we exist in. But the the more the more that we can allocate resources to those kind of uh, those kind of administrative staff, they they just make our lives easier. And I I can give maybe one specific example. So this like I I don't know about you guys, but I did not realize when I became a university professor like how hard it was get, like i'm not an accountant like how hard it was going to be to do the budgeting side of things right so like always make, we have grants that come in but you write a grant proposal you don't know if you're going to get it then there's student admissions and students need to get you know paid stipends or whatever and keeping keeping the ins equal to the outs is like really not straightforward at all and i have zero like actual formal training in like how to balance a budget so uh, yeah, so having really, uh, yeah, proactive and skilled staff who can help with these these kind of things that actually as professors, we have little to zero formal training in actually doing. To me, that's the way that we can best support the, the research agenda of the university. Thanks, Tim. How about you, Ali? Yeah, I think uh, Liam uh, summarized well people behind the scene who are doing the great job, especially uh, staffs, collaborators, also students who are, I mean, in the heart of uh, our job. So we are working to, uh, to to have those kind of students. And when I first joined academia, um, so as a nearly career researcher, I found myself uh, uh, with a bunch of challenges to especially balance multiple roles. So as you said, uh, we have to uh, conduct high quality research, but at the same time, we need uh, to teach. We need also to mentor students, to build a professional network, to collaborate with um, people from academia, from industry, and managing those responsibilities um, is, is challenging while striving to publish consistently in, 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 in leading venues can be like uh, uh, like the main challenge that we are facing as, as, um, as um, people for, as academians. So, uh, so the people behind the, behind the scene, like uh, staffs in, in our universities or in the community, uh, collaborators, who are still helping us to, uh, to find the best trade-off between um, uh, uh, those roles or kind of balance between those roles. Because as you said, so when I first uh, uh, joined academia, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not like, I cannot do the management of projects Still, we can write research projects, but managing them and uh, uh, doing all the work so it's not something easy we can do. 
Uh, so yeah, I, I, I would say we also uh, we we. We always need that kind of uh, of support. Looking also at the other side uh, or the main side of uh, of our job, which is mentoring students and preparing them for both academia and industry careers, here is the most challenging part. So as much as we invest or personally invest on research, I have also the responsibility uh, to ensure that my students uh, receive the guidance and you know, support uh, that they need to become the next generation of uh, uh, innovators and uh, in uh, the leaders in the field, because this is like a kind of uh, sustainability in our uh, in our field, and we need to to get those kind of people so that they they will bring a lot of uh, I mean innovation in in the future. So despite these challenges, uh, so these present also opportunities for growth so we are still learning from uh, those challenges and the view I, I view them as part of uh, the journey in establishing like uh, myself in, in academia and still i think uh, the journey is, is, is quite long for the many years to come to make a meaningful impact uh, in the field yeah all um thank you um I know that uh, we have uh, some uh, questions from the audience as well, and I will redirect them to you, but I should also mention that in doing all of these things, there are some very important things that we we need to realize as especially early career um, researchers that there has to be still, regardless of how busy our lives are, work life balance in our lives. Uh, we need to ensure that we are maintaining a really healthy balance. At the same time, partnerships are incredibly important and that's one of the powers, beauties of what Brian described. Uh, partnerships with your colleagues, academic colleagues, partnership with industry colleagues, partnership from others from around the world because today issues are so complex and so multidimensional that it requires that kind of partnership approach. And beyond that, of course, for any researcher, but especially the early career one, you have to be curious all the time. And when you do those partnerships, you enter into, and I think Kelly mentioned that, to some questions, some solutions that the, you don't even have questions for. And those are the big game changers. Now, let me turn it back to you, Liam. Uh, what would you be your What would be your be your advice to an early career researcher? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. I think, as you just articulated, like it's a starting starting an academic position is one of the busiest times of your academic career for sure. And also, there's some possibility that you also have other life constraints that tends to somehow align uh i think for the most part the the advice i would give is just try to have like you said like try to have coffee with a lot of people you know um be open minded but on the other hand you have to you have to learn to say no to things also so uh it's a balance between being really open minded and talking to a lot of people to get a lot of good and diverse perspectives. But then when you're actually going to decide which types of projects you're actually going to commit and invest real time into, uh, for that, you want to be relatively selective for that. It's uh, less is more actually. And uh, it's very, very, very common pitfall I, I've seen. And it, it was probably mine as well. Uh, it's very easy to get stretched too thin uh, very early on in your career. And then it's just not fun anymore. It's just like, uh, it's just completely overwhelming and, uh, and you're not, you're not having fun. So um, yeah, maybe, yeah, to synthesize, yeah. Open mind, but selective on how you actually use your time. So Ali, um, um, we are very grateful for all the, um, as researchers, financial support we receive, whether it's uh, federal, provincial, or private, uh, but we are entrusted with um, money uh, at the end, and we need, we are accountable for it. How do you manage your accounting? How do you manage all those things, making sure that the graduate students are paid, and you know you 
um, are you're 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 not falling behind. This is one of the questions from the audience that how do you keep track of your accounting while you're also publishing, doing all kinds of other all kinds of other things. Yeah, maybe I can go first. So, you know, uh, so we are doing research and we have uh, like research teams that should be paid scholarship. So it's very important part. And uh, in parallel with doing research, we, we have one of the roles is to write research funds and bring uh, findings and bring uh, uh, new research projects. And uh, so funding can be always a big challenge, you know, especially for uh, uh, like uh, early career researchers, especially when competing for national and uh, international grants. So the key to maintain like a record of uh, uh, impactful research and stay connected with industry uh, needs and continuously innovate in high demand areas, uh, like in my field in software engineering, in EI, that are uh, needed in, in, in the market so that uh, uh, we will have better chance or more chance to have uh, those research grants accepted. So, you know, writing a research grant is not something easy. So we spend a lot of, uh, let's say, weeks or even months writing a proposal. And then we will be waiting for maybe a couple of months or even a year to get the response so that we can pay our students. So while the process to secure funding is very competitive, the demand for innovative solutions in, in, um, in uh, areas like AI or software engineering creates a lot of opportunities as well for funding, especially with today's large scale and complex uh, software systems. So, uh, Thank you, Ali. Yes. Thank you. I mean, this is, as well, you could see, um, this is this this is a conversation that we could have a couple of more hours or, you know, rest of the uh, afternoon. But I want to thank um, both of you again, uh, congratulations, uh, Liam, Ali, um, and I'm sure that you will, this is just the beginning in a way, but there's, there's a lot more for you, uh, waiting for you. Uh, thank you, Profound Impact, for giving me this opportunity, uh, to talk to these two brilliant researchers. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you, Ali and Liam, for being with us today and for Faraday. Thank you, as always. You are such a, a great uh, host with this, uh, always with this fireside chat. And um, I want to congratulate again the three CSCAN, InfoCAN Outstanding Early Career Researchers for the Computer Science Research Award. Uh, Dr. Roger Gross from University of Toronto, Ali Uni from ETS Montreal, and Liam Paul. University of Montreal. Thank Profound you, Jerry. Impact is, is, is proud to sponsor Thank you very this, much. and I wish you well in your research career. All right, everyone. In addition, if you, uh, the, if the audience, is, if you're interested in our research impact offering, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of our sales team to book a customized demo or learn more. The video for this event today will be available on Profound Impact's YouTube channel tomorrow. And thank you again to the audience for joining us today for Profound Impact Day 2024 and for your support. And I hope that you will make your week an impactful one.